Welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast, your monthly source for conversations and curated content to improve your law practice with your host, Rocky Deer. Hi, and welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast. If you're a lawyer in America, you can brag to your loved ones that you are literally one in a million. It's true. There are just over 1.3 million lawyers in the United States. We have over 100,000 in Texas alone. So while it's nice to be one in a million, how do you stand out? How do you make a name for yourself? If you've been trying to answer these questions, well, have I got the episode for you. I actually have two guests today. Now, this is Texas. We still have some old-fashioned values, so I'm going to start with ladies first. Amy Boardman Hunt is the owner of Muse Communications LLC in Dallas. She specializes in branding, PR, and content marketing for lawyers. But she herself is not a lawyer. She's actually chosen to work amongst us. We're going to find out more about that in just a moment. I also have Jean Major, who is the Attorney Compliance Division Director and Director of Advertising Review for the State Bar of Texas. He, of course, is in Austin. They will be here to tell us what we should do and what we absolutely shouldn't do. See? It's a two-for-one. But wait, there's more. We will also be providing some links to resources in the description section of this episode, so check them out. Amy, Jean, thank you both for being here. Welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you. Absolutely. So, Amy, let's let's start with you. Now, branding for lawyers. I know I know a lot of lawyers, you know, spend some time thinking about this, but can you give us kind of an overview of what what do you think lawyers can do better when trying to build their brands in this sea of so many other talented lawyers out there? Well, I I don't think any lawyers, nobody went to law school because they wanted to become a salesperson. <laughs> so I think because it's just not in lawyers' DNA um, to go out and do the kind of sales that we all think of when we, when we talk about sales. So I'm much more inclined to recommend what the, the kind of marketing I do, which is called content marketing where you're really just sharing information. Okay, so what is that? It's a model of marketing where you do things like what we're doing here, blogging, social media, email newsletters, podcasts, webinars, anything that's primarily about sharing knowledge and less about sales. And it's a model that I'm uh, much more comfortable with, but it's really an ideal marketing model for most lawyers that I know as well. But what about when I was a young lawyer back in the Herbert Hoover administration? You know, it, it, the the idea that older lawyers used to tell me was, you know, look, you've got to build relationships. You want to go out there. You want to be you want to be seen in your community. You want people to know who you are. You want them to think of you when they have a problem. You know, is that is that no longer valid? Do we now switch to blogging and podcasts and the, and all that, or do they work side by side? God, no. I still think that that is that that personal relationships are the most important thing that any of us can be doing in my business and your business that building personal relationships is still the most important thing. And if you've got the metabolism and the budget to go to Bob's Steak and Chop House every night for dinner, (laughs) more power to you. But, you know, we'd all die of a heart attack uh, if we actually did that. So I still believe that those personal relationships should be at the center of most people's business development efforts, but we don't have the time or the budget to do as much as we need. So things like blogging, social media, email newsletters, to sort of go with the base model there, they can really bridge that gap um, to help you nurture your referral network. So your network of people that you've learned, you know, that you've met in law school, that you've met in other jobs, your clients, your former clients, that is all a, a very valuable. It's your next to your brain. It's your most important business asset. So your marketing efforts should really be about staying in touch with that network. And that's where things like blogging, social media, and email newsletters can come in in a, in a very low-touch, non-intrusive way. And it's also very budget-friendly. You know, and, and, and one of the things that I see is in, in some of the presentations I do is it, you know it's it's not a shock that according to to I think it's Google Consumer Survey out in 2014, 96 percent of people seeking legal advice use a search engine. Again, that number is probably low nowadays. But you filter some of these down, and it said that 71 percent of people looking for a lawyer 
still think it's important to have a local lawyer. So to kind of back what Amy's saying, you need the web presence. You need the social media presence. You need to have a good, effective website. But you need to think locally as well. You know, attend your local bar association meetings. Get out and do some sort of pro bono stuff. Get your name out locally as well through emails, through your newsletters to current clients and past clients. Because that's how you're going to tie that. That's going to help draw those people back to your website or back to your social media. So, you know, in my experience, or at least my observation, is that a lot of lawyers, most lawyers, spend time kind of marketing and advertising and building relationships with other lawyers. I don't know that as many lawyers are spending time really reaching out into their local communities and and spending time with non-lawyers. Do you guys find that that's also the case or is that just is is that just kind of me and 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 my little world cuz you know the reason I'm asking that is to what extent should lawyers be marketing to other lawyers versus going out and trying to meet people you know non-lawyers in their communities Well I'll I'll be happy to talk about this to to a certain extent you have to do both when I ask my clients where do you get most of your business And they will almost always say it's referrals, referrals from current clients and referrals from other lawyers. So uh, particularly lawyers who are on the opposite side. So if you are an employment lawyer representing employers, it's good to stay in touch with the plaintiff side of who you are, you know, by nature of your business. So I don't think it's an either or. I think it's uh, both and. Gene, do you agree? Yeah, you know, it you look at the the role of a of an attorney in their in their local community. Going back to the ideas that these are the stalwarts, the pillars of the community, the ones who who need to go out and do volunteer work whether it's through um school or through civics or through just any any organization that's local. That is how you go ahead. And again, you're drawing people to your name. You're drawing people to your brand. Where are they going to go when they want to look something up? They're going to go to the internet. They're going to go to Google. They're going to search for that name. They're going to go to your website. But in order to make sure that you, you get those people drawing in that way, you have to go out. And I think you have to establish yourself as, with non-lawyers and with lawyers as well. It is so vital to make sure that you go ahead ahead and are seen and are known about locally, as well as having such a very good social media and electronic presence. Well, let, let's talk maybe for a minute about about the content. You know, Amy, you talked about about actual the actual content marketing, but let's talk about the content of one's message. And again, I see I see a lot of lawyers and a lot of firms where they try to be very careful. They don't want to. They take a conservative approach to their messaging. And they try not to be offensive to anyone. Is that is that a wiser approach? Should lawyers try to be edgier? You know, how should they be kind of branding themselves in terms of how they outreach to the communities? Is it are are you trying to be are you trying to be the least offensive, or are you trying to kind of carve out a niche with people that might be drawn to you? And and I know there's probably two schools of thought on that, but I wanted to see you two as experts. What do y'all think? Well, I I think that you can be edgy and. Um memorable and unique without being offensive. So, you know, a lot of that is in tone and, you know, some of it is, Mm. is your graphic identity, you know, a lot of, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So if you have a nice logo, that's going to go a long way. And if you could, you can be a little cheeky. (laughs) Um, One of my favorite purveyors of, of this is a, is an attorney in Sadly, I don't represent him. He's a, he's a labor and employment lawyer out of the Midwest or Pennsylvania or something like that, who sends every day, he sends an employment law newsletter. And I don't quite know how he does it, but he's very memorable and very pointed. Um, but he is, you know, he's probably a little edgier than most people are comfortable with being, but nothing that I've read puts me makes me think, oh boy, he really ticked off a lot of people just now with what he said. Because the advice the lawyers give, you know, the the things that you guys talk about, there is a definite point of view. I mean, if you're representing executives, you're saying one thing. If you're representing employers, you're saying another thing. I keep going back to employment law, but it's a it's an easy one to go back to. There's obviously a million other practice areas there. 
Um, so I think you can be edgy and unique and memorable without being anywhere close to offensive. Gene, I'm sure you've seen in, in, in your role, you've probably seen a lot of different ways that lawyers market themselves. Would you, would you agree with that? Do you think there's any lessons you've taken away about that, that issue of threading the needle between edgy and memorable, but still not offending people? You know, I think Amy touches on it real well. And that is, you have to know your market. You have to know who you're tailoring your message towards. Like you said, um, Rocky, there's over a hundred thousand licensed Texas lawyers. And when the legislature's in town, I think most of them are in Austin. So, you know, it, it really comes down to understanding who you're tailoring your message to. A guy or, or, or a small criminal defense firm who's hung out their shingle is going to be tailoring their message a little bit differently than, let's say, an employment law firm or, 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 or a corporate firm. So I think they can get a little bit more edgier. You have to know exactly who you're looking to try and draw into your, you know, who do you want sitting in your waiting room, basically, is, is, is the message you're looking at. You know, we've got people from, um, a wonderful example is, is, is a criminal defense lawyer in the Dallas-Fort Worth area uh, who calls himself the Law Hawk and did a bunch of um, videos. Again, somebody who came out of, um, out of Texas Tech Law School very much just a boots on the ground um, type attorney, but made and carved out a nice little niche for himself by doing something a little bit more edgier and a little bit more tailored toward the demographic he's looking for. Well, let's talk also for a second about issues like social media, right? So what do you think is the most effective use of things like Twitter and LinkedIn you know, are lawyers using Facebook for marketing? And if so, what are some of the effective ways that they're, that they're doing so? I think Twitter is best if you are, you know, Twitter is a, is a tough place. I mean, it's, it's pretty toxic right now, to be brutally honest. I don't really even counsel most of my law firm clients to create a Twitter account if they don't already have one. Oh, that's interesting. It's really hard to get traction and it's hard to get an awful lot of followers without being really edgy. I mean, you see people, the people with the most followers are the ones who are on there multiple times a day, and they are really very, very opinionated. Mm. Um, they're the ones that I think, you know, go right up to the edge. And I think you have to be personally invested in it. Um, and and so Twitter is a hard one, I think, for people to make any any headway on. Um, Facebook, I do have some clients that do really well on Facebook, but most of those started out as a uh, an, an individual lawyer who personally had their own personal presence on Facebook. And then when they started their company, that Facebook audience followed them. So if you're not already somebody who is super involved in Facebook, Facebook might be hard to get some traction in unless you want to start to invest some money into doing promoted posts. My favorite uh, for professional purposes is no surprise LinkedIn. And I, I think it's actually a pretty, I mean, as, as a consumer, I think LinkedIn's pretty boring, but it's also where uh, professionals go to talk about professional things. It's the most civil of all social media. And it's the, it's the place that you're <laughs> for the most part. To go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it's truly, I mean, it's about, uh, you know, 50% pretty civil. It's nothing like right. Twitter or, or Facebook these days. So it's where that I, I recommend both companies make sure they have a, a presence, but also individuals make sure that you've got a robust LinkedIn presence. Cause it's the first place people go to check you out if they don't know you. Well, and what about Instagram? What do you think of that? I, I've heard tell of it. I'm not on Instagram, but I'm curious to know your thoughts on that. I think if you have a practice that lends itself to Instagram, you could. And I don't. Nobody that I work with does actually. Um, I, I, I know of a of an attorney who has sort of an agriculture based practice where they were their audience were were people like independent growers. And people who do have a presence on Instagram. So I think if the people that you're targeting are on Instagram, you should be on Instagram. But it's very, you know, image heavy. So you want to make sure that you're promoting 
things that have, uh, you need to make sure that there's a graphic element to your promotion. So I don't do, uh, I have some clients that are on Instagram, but it's not their legal things that they do on Instagram. It's they have sort of side gigs that are on Instagram. Obviously, we see more Facebook and and website um, materials because that is what's generally being um, presented to the public about information that attorneys are disseminating about their legal services, which is precisely what Part 7 of the rules is designed to deal with. And, And Amy's right. You saw in the beginning, you saw personal Facebook pages where people would just kind of mention the fact that they're a lawyer or mention the fact of where they worked, to now where you have law firms that have very dynamic, very diverse Facebook pages. Uh, It's almost commonplace to have not only just your, your personal Facebook page, but also your business Facebook page as well. Those are the ones that we see more of next to obviously just websites. We don't see, you know, we don't see a lot of Twitter because it, it really is kind of hard to, again, disseminate compliant information about your legal services. And a lot of what's on LinkedIn is actually exempt from the filing requirements under the rules. You know, you can put up your your CV or your resume and some information about basic information about your practice without having to have it filed with advertising review. So we obviously see more of a, of a dynamic approach coming through Facebook pages and websites than anything else. Well, and so, Gene, what you just said kind of creates an interesting segue because we're talking about the rules, but I don't think we've actually we actually talked about what the rules say. So can you walk us through, you know, for lawyers that are out there trying to market, when do they need to have something reviewed by the state bar? How do they go about getting something reviewed? And, you know, what are the rules behind what is acceptable and what isn't? You know, it's it's the rules cover, again, information you're disseminating about your legal services. So you really have to hone in on that. So it's information that's being disseminated to the public about what you do. And it's codified as part seven of the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct. Violating these rules uh, could be, uh, is a grievable offense. We see about 3,500 submissions per year, and I'll send maybe 2530 to the Chief Disciplinary Counsel's Office for review. So we really work hard with trying to make sure we, we come up with compliant information. We come up with compliant images or, or compliant language. Uh, we really try to work with attorneys and law firms to make sure we can find some sort of compromise there. The main thing to remember about the rules is is really the idea that it prohibits false, misleading, and deceptive communications. That's the cornerstone to the rules, and that's the cornerstone to all the different avenues to the rules that cover different parts of advertisement, whether it's a solicitation communication or a television ad. The main premise to the rules is really, again, to prohibit false, misleading, and deceptive communication. So, for example, you know, Amy was talking about content marketing earlier. So let's talk about what is and is not within the scope of the rules. You said LinkedIn isn't. What about content marketing? What about websites? What about Facebook pages? You know, amongst these, what, what do lawyers need to get state bar sign-off on before they go and post something up? It really goes back to what Amy uh, does, and that's content marketing. We're interested in the content of what an attorney is disseminating about their legal services. So really, the, the, the avenue that you're using or the media you're using, there's different rules that are designed for that, like there's different rules for television ads versus a solicitation communication versus a website. But we're really more interested, again, in, in what the attorney is disseminating about their legal services. And to that end, there's some very good information that an attorney can use that's actually exempt from the filing requirements. Um, If you look at, if you pull out your business card, uh, you can use that information. But you can also laundry list areas of practice. You can put down whether you're board certified. You can put down dates of admission to any federal jurisdictions or other bar associations. We're seeing more and more actual um, CPAs and registered nurses entering into the legal profession. 
So if you have, if, if this is a second career, if you have a technical or professional license, you can put that down. All that type of information is exempt from the rules. So it doesn't matter if it's a website or a Facebook page or, or, or a LinkedIn page or an advertisement in your, in your local magazine or newspaper, if, the, if you can find a newspaper nowadays. But, you know, it's, it's really based upon that content is what we're looking at. That's why it's important that, you know, attorneys understand that, 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 that the, the filing requirements is what goes beyond some of that exempt information. And to work with people like Amy, Amy does it a very effective job of, of honing their message in and making sure it's compliant under our rules. Well, it, what about things like logos? Do logos get covered within within that ambit or are you free to put whatever graphics you want you're really looking more at the at the written product that's in the advertisement can you walk us through that a little bit sure absolutely and and logos it goes back to the idea of uh law firms trying to brand themselves goes back to the idea of trying to shorten names where you had five different names to the law firm you know now there's only two or three Logos are covered as well because obviously we don't want somebody who has, uh, you know, three dollar bill signs out as their logo, you know. But it is important to understand and to look at. I think URLs are also very important to, for law firms and attorneys to look at. Make sure you have a pretty dynamic URL. That URL now goes on everything. It goes on your letterhead. It goes on your business card. Again. Drawing, you know, using using effective media to draw them into into your electronic presence is part of the key, I think, to good attorney marketing and good attorney advertising. So, you know, think of your URL, but it can't be false, misleading, and deceptive. So you can say your DallasCriminalLaw.com. You just can't say your best DallasCriminalLaw.com. All right. So, Amy, let's turn this over to you and get your perspective for just a second. So. You know, we've we've talked about content. We've talked about compliance in the work that you're doing. When when a law firm or a lawyer comes to you and says, you know, I want some help with my branding and my messaging, are you focusing on compliance from the very beginning, or when you're brainstorming, do you say, look, let's think about the branding, let's think about the messaging first, and then figure out how to make it compliant later? So, in other words, it's kind of like a chicken and the egg. Is it first compliance and then the messaging, or is it? messaging and then compliance, or is there some kind of hybrid of the two? I think it's closer to the hybrid. Everything is, their messaging is always going to be compliant. If we're talking about what their messaging is, if they want to come up with a tagline, you know, we'll come up with taglines, but if anything gets close to the edge or somebody wants to say, you know, an unjustifiable comparison, we'll say, eh, no, we can't do that. That's out the door. We don't, we, we aren't going to come anywhere close to that. And so, you know, we will start from the very beginning, only suggesting language and themes that are compliant. Um, and most of that comes into comparisons. You know, you, you can't really say anything that you're, you know, better than or the best or anything like that. So it is always baked into the cake when we're meeting with a new client, you know, and it's, it's really very much focused on who are your clients and what are their concerns and how can we talk to them and where. So that's really, you know, what we focus on. But compliance is really baked into the cake. One of the things we do is part of the process is once we, I review a file, um, if I find something that looks to be in a violation of a rule, we send along a, a, a letter that details the specific part of the rule that we say this, this ad potentially violates. And we send a, a copy of what we see to the attorney, and if they're working with, with a marketing company um, like Muse or, or, or Amy, then they can request a copy of that as well. And we'll give them time to go ahead and figure out and make changes. That's really where a lot of the communication for advertising review comes into play, is not just hammering people over the head with what they can't do, but trying to work out solutions for what they can do depending on if it's filed concurrently, 
uh, which would be something along the lines of putting your website up and filing at the same time, or if you're doing this for pre-approval, which we suggest for television ads and billboards and things like that, uh, where you'd send it to us about 25 days prior to it being disseminated out. So we really work hard with trying to make sure we, we find compliance for us comfortable with the rules and for getting the attorney's or, or law firm's message out as well. So it's important to understand just because you, you might get a letter from us saying that this is, this is in violation of the rules, there is time to make a, there is time to cure it. There is time to go ahead and make a change. Compliance is the, is the key to us. It's not necessarily, again, just, just hammering people over the head with what they're prohibited to say. So it's a it's a collaborative process, in other words, sounds like. It can be at times, absolutely. Now, Gene, you mentioned something about television advertising. I understand September first, two thousand nineteen is gonna is gonna have some changes down the pike for those that advertise on television, specifically via Senate Bill eleven eighty nine. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Eleven eighty nine came about um, has an as an idea to some of the TV ads that you see, and, and a lot of these are some more of your national pharmaceutical or medical device type ads, and I think we've all seen those uh, on television, you know, especially you know late at night or what have you, and those ads kind of get kind of get lost. I think the message has to who the attorney is or who's actually providing the legal service gets lost in there. Uh, so the Texas legislature looked at some of these, these types of ads and came up with some very specific ideas as to uh, disclosures, um, some prohibited language you can't use in regards to these pharmaceutical and medical device ads. And it's important to understand that that's really the intent of the legislation was to look at those type of ads. So your local car wreck type uh, ads and things like that won't apply to this. But if you if you look at those those ads, and I just use you know throw out any pharmaceutical you want to throw out, name wise, you know you, you have to go ahead and put down that state that this is an advertisement for legal services, so that the public is aware of what's coming at them. You know some of these ads would sit there and say that you know some sort of government entity or some you know has has warned people that this type of drug or what have you can cause these side effects and they throw up the um the FDA logo you can't throw up the logo you can still warn people it's just kind of adding certain amount of clarity to some of these and again these are more your national pharmaceutical and medical device ads so we're getting a lot of questions as to whether or not this applies to, to car wreck ads, PI, personal injury type television ads. And we're seeing that through the legislative intent of this is really geared towards those other types. And as I understand it, 1189 is not going to be just 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 a legal ethics rule. This is actually going to be part of the, the Deceptive Trade Practices Act in Texas. Did I understand that correctly? Did I read that correctly? That is absolutely correct. It's the uh, attorney general or a district or county attorney can uh, raise claim under the Deceptive Practices Act. What, what's interesting that uh, they added a, a, a somewhat safe harbor for, for attorneys as well. And that involves the advertising review committee in that or advertising review in that if an attorney wants to send in, again, for that pre-approval process prior to it being disseminated on television, their script or their ad, and it deals with, again, pharmaceuticals, it deals with um, medical device type um, of, of advertisement, we can go ahead and look at it, approve it, it went under both um, Part 7 of the rules and under um, the Senate Bill 1189, which is actually going to be codified as 81.151. We can send an attorney that pre-approval notice, and if it gets challenged by a county or district attorney, uh, they can go ahead and, and state that they garnered that, pre, that pre-approval for that advertising, and it kind of holds, holds at bay the idea of not necessarily being challenged, but being litigated against. Got it. Okay. It just promotes more the idea of getting pre-approval before you just go launching a commercial, in other words. 
Right. It, you know, the idea of garnering that pre-approval. And also, again, it's pretty clear the disclosures and disclaimer information in the statute as well. So it's, it's not necessarily, I think, going to be too onerous for people to comply. And Gene, we've got about another 30 seconds left, but can you tell us very briefly, I'm, I'm hearing there's a new process for referenda that's possibly coming down the pike. Can you, can you comment at all on that for us? Sure. The idea of the, the Committee for Disciplinary Rules and Referendum was formed out of the last legislative process um, in terms of uh, a really a committee that kind of houses and starts the, the rule-changing or rule-making process. What they do is they're actually looking at uh, revisions to Part 7 of the rules, which is, again, our advertising rules. From there, it goes from that committee to the Board of Directors. From the Board of Directors, it goes to the um, Texas Supreme Court to go ahead and decide when to order a vote on the rules. Uh, so we're, we're kind of in the beginning stages of this. Uh, the Committee for uh, Disciplinary Rules and Referendum, the CDRR, has all their information. They're very transparent in terms of what they're doing. It's on our website, texasbar.com forward slash CDRR. And you can see and comment, and they're always looking for comments on uh, the propo- what they're proposing has the new revisions to the advertising rules. The key to that is that they're still keeping, again, that cornerstone idea of information you're disseminating about your legal services cannot be false, misleading, and deceptive. Wow. I'm sure there's a, there's a lot more we could talk about, but unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. I want to thank my guests, Amy Hunt and Gene Major, for joining us. And of course, I want to thank you for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please rate and review us in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Until next time, remember, life's a journey, folks. I'm Rocky Deer, signing off for now. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Go to TexasBar.com slash podcasts. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Find both the State Bar of Texas and Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, the State Bar of Texas, Legal Talk Network, or their respective officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.